On behalf of the New School, I'd like to welcome all of you here. Uh, this is, to me, a delightful um, a joy of being able to introduce Mark Pendergrass. Mark wrote um, uh, The History of Coca-Cola, which I read in 1993. Do, none of you probably can remember back that far. Uh, you were all too young for that. Uh, but all I can do is say it was one of those formative books that I read that I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, Mark, of course, has written a number of other books, at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that is that correct or more? N uh, nine that he wants to talk about. Something like that. Uh, including a couple elementary school books, um, as well as uh, the two books that we will be talking about tonight. The first is For God and Country and Coca-Cola, The Definitive History of the Great American Soft Drink and the Company that uh, Makes It. Uh, this was the book that you did publish in 1993. Uh, the second book that came out that we will be talking about tonight is Uncommon Grounds, The History of Coffee and How It Transformed Our World. Uh, these books are important for several reasons. A, because they're extremely uh, well written and indeed well researched. And those of us that have tried to write a book on any research topic know that it is not an easy task to do to begin with. Um, and secondly, he found the original uh, formula for Coca-Cola. Now, I just want you to know, uh, and the shock about, I don't know if you're going to talk about this or, or not, he will mention in passing, the shock is, is that Coca-Cola gave it to him and they didn't know what they sent him. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that in passing. Um, Mark was, um, started off uh, his career as a secondary teacher, then decided he would prefer to teach elementary school, teach, uh, school until he did that and then concluded that maybe elementary school wouldn't be the right place for him either. And he went into, did any of you teach elementary school? Yes, we, I can see why people don't understand Most that. Most difficult job in the world. I agree. A very honorable profession. So he became a research librarian, which didn't have any elementary school children um, there. And he's engaged in research librarian for a long time, then uh, started writing a large number of articles. And I didn't know that about um, Mark until today, when you started talking about that. A freelance writer uh, was very successful. And uh, he, an agent sent him a note saying, well, I'm looking for books. What do you think? And he uh, just happened that the agent was from Atlanta as well, or just you. Mark is from Atlanta. So I just thought I'd mention that, although he has flown down uh, today from Vermont. Uh, so uh, he decided w one among many topics happened to be a history of Coca-Cola, and it is a wonderful book. Now, both of his books are wonderful, not just because they're well-researched, not just because they're well-written, uh, but because the fact that they've gone through multiple editions. Now, n those of us who have published books know that going through one edition is a lot. Uh, making it through three editions, which his latest um, for God, Country, and Coca-Cola did is an incredible uh, feat. So my congratulations to you on both books, but particularly the third edition. We do have copies of the book. Mark has uh, decided that he will be willing to autograph the books at the end. I just thought I'd mention that. And um, If you it would... buy them, I'll make them out to my very best new friend. <laughs> So if you want to be Mark's best new friend and, uh, and connect with him on Facebook and Twitter, all you have to do is just go ahead and buy a book. Um, we will have a time at the end for questions, uh, but uh, as this is being recorded, we need you to speak into a microphone. So when we open this up, for, and any question is fine uh, with Mark, um, most questions are fine with Mark. Um, we will make sure that you can uh, be heard on the microphone, and uh, then we will go from there. Uh, Mark. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, I have an, uh, an hour from this moment uh, for, for question, including question and answers. So my intention is to talk for maybe 40 minutes or less, if I can, to allow plenty of time, I hope, for multiple questions. And I think you may have them. So I'm going to talk about the books in chronological order, kind of. Coffee is a lot older than Coca-Cola. Um, coffee was invented uh, on the, by God on the hills of Ethiopia. Um, and the uh, natives probably figured out that it had this very interesting co uh, uh, caffeine in it. Um, 
and they would grind it up and put it in like animal fat for quick energy. But it wasn't until the uh, 1400s probably that somebody either by accident or on purpose threw some of the seeds in a fire and it, my theory is that it smelled really good and that they consequently maybe put it in some hot water that was brewing and that's how coffee as we know it was invented. So by the uh, 1500s, it had spread throughout the Arab world. It was being cultivated in Yemen as well as in Ethiopia. Let me just mention, I, I, I'm talking about the caffeinated world here, right? So let me just, uh, let's see. This is my little thing about coffee. Uh, caffeine is a drug which is produced by quite a few different plants uh, all of them in the tropics. And I'm going to also be talking about the coca leaf with its cocaine, which also grows in the tropics. And I was thinking about this today. The reason, uh, you probably haven't thought about this, but I'm pretty sure that the reason that these plants have these psychotropic drugs is that they are a natural pesticide. They're trying to protect themselves because there's no winter there. It's more difficult for plant life. There, it's, you know, nature red in tooth and claw uh, all year round. So I think that's why you find many very interesting drugs and, and medicines coming from tropical plants. And um, so coffee, I say, is it black puddle water? That's what the uh, women of... Uh, of London called it when, when they were uh, very angry at coffee, uh, which I'll get into in a second. The gift of the gods is what the Arabs called it. The scourge of the earth, uh, it has been very bad for the environment uh, in many ways because, for instance, in Brazil, <clears throat> they would develop a monoculture of coffee by cutting down the rainforest and burning everything, growing coffee until the the soil was depleted and then move on somewhere else. Friend of birds, but nowadays coffee is the closest thing if it's grown under shade, which is how it naturally grows under a canopy of taller trees. Uh, it provides uh, almost the equal biodiversity to a natural rainforest. So one of the first things I did when I was researching this book was to go to Washington, D.C. to a meeting in 1996 that was sponsored by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird uh, Center, uh, all about coffee. And they had figured out that the migratory birds were going down into the funnel of Central America and that their habitat was quickly disappearing and their habitat was shade-grown coffee. So. That has been a big movement to do that. Slave labor, uh, coffee w was grown uh, in the, uh, first it was only in the Arab world. Then the, uh, the Dutch got hold of some plants and took them to the uh, East Indies, to Java, Ceylon, where they enslaved the natives uh, and mistreated them terribly. Um, then the French took a tree to Martinique around 1723, and uh, from that one tree, supposedly, most of the coffee in the Western Hemisphere descended, but they enslaved Africans in order to grow their coffee as well as their sugar. Uh, but now coffee has become sort of the avatar for fair trade and for you know, now more and more, th and I think this is a very good thing, people are beginning to pay attention to where does their food come from, where do all of their products come from, and what kind of ethical implications does that have? And coffee has been the avatar f for this, although it's not as clear cut as people think in terms of fair trade good, everything else bad, and I could go into that perhaps in the question and answer period. Coffee is a very labor-intensive crop. One of the reasons is that, as you can see from this picture, um, it doesn't ripen all at the same time. And in fact, it's worse even than this picture. So you only want to pick the ripe red cherries, or sometimes they're yellow, 
And it means you have to come back two or three times on the same tree and very selectively pick it. But you also have to prune it, fertilize it. Um, uh, then once you've picked it, processing it is not s as simple as you'd think. You can't just strip off everything. Uh, it has to go through an elaborate process to pr process it, and there are a variety of methods of doing that. Um, coffee really became popular in Europe between 1650 and 1700, all over Europe, but particularly in England. We think of England as being a tea-drinking country, but they were first a coffee-drinking country. Um, so much so that, <clears throat> and in most places in Europe, they were an egalitarian place. And that was true in England too, but it, egalitarian only for men. Um, they wouldn't let women in the coffee houses, and the women were quite upset with this. The men would come home, and the women felt that they weren't performing properly their sexual function. So uh, they wrote the women's petition against coffee, and in it they in very Shakespearean, bawdy terms, described why they were upset that the men would come home with uh, nothing stiff but their gait, nothing, nothing moist but their nostrils. I can't remember. Uh, it was quite funny. Uh, the men answered that uh, this was totally untrue, that, in fact, coffee added a spiritual essency to the sperm. Um, I don't know whether that solved their problems or not. This is the uh, cross-section of a, of a coffee bean. You have to strip all this stuff away, basically. And there's a picture here <clears throat> of a family in Guatemala taken in 1915, and if you've gone down to Guatemala any time recently, it looks almost the same. It's, it, nothing much has changed, and you'll see people with babies on their backs or on their fronts, and you'll see children uh, picking the coffee also which is not necessarily a terrible thing if it's during the uh, holiday season and they're helping their parents. Um, at least, I don't think so. Uh, here, I mentioned uh, Brazil was one of the places that enslaved uh, Africans. Um, they kept slavery until 1888, longer than we did here, uh, longer than anyone else in the Western Hemisphere, all because of coffee. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, coffee had become a uh, very uh, uh, a commodity that was traded on the stock exchange. This is from a novel called The Corner and Coffee that I found from 1904. <clears throat> the crowd of brokers heaved and surged and swayed like a human wave. The place was like a battlefield in the tense emotions in the air the awful passions it evoked. Well, they were having awful passions and yelling and screaming because the price of coffee was collapsing. Uh, there was too much coffee being grown in Brazil. Of course, most of these people had never seen coffee being grown and had no idea uh, of the um, immense amount of work that went into it. Uh, this was the beginning of the boom-bust cycle, which is continuing to this day, where when the price of coffee goes up, people will plant more coffee trees, and they will tend them very carefully. In four years or five years, those trees will begin to bear heavily, not until then. So coffee is a very labor-intensive and capital-intensive investment. At that point, there would be too much coffee in the world. The, pri the price would, would collapse, and everybody would then abandon their coffee, or else they would pick it, but they wouldn't take very good care of the trees, and eventually the price would go up again. And that's what's happening right now. We are entering a very bad bust cycle. Just three years ago, the price was at historic highs. And they were saying, oh, we're finished with the boom bust cycle. Everybody's drinking coffee. The Asians are drinking coffee in the Pacific Rim. There will be no problem. And I said, that's not true. I don't believe it. And I, I was right, unfortunately. Um, it's a picture of women in the U.S. Uh, at, in a packing plant. Coffee is not a very forgiving product. You can ruin it anywhere along the line, and one of the ways to ruin it is to let it go stale after you've roasted it. It begins to stale when it's in contact with oxygen, so all of these canned coffees had to be pre-staled to some degree, even though they had invented, they invented vacuum packing, but that didn't help all that much. 
Anyway, and the sorting that goes on, you can see the women uh, down there uh, uh, in Central uh, America, uh, and that's still true. The sorting, the hand sorting is done by women everywhere in the world I've ever gone, and which has been several continents now to see people growing coffee. It's always the women who, who have the menial jobs, whereas the men get to be the special tasters. These are the cuppers, as they were called, or liquorers, as the British called them, who sit around and they go <laughs> and slurp the coffee up so that it sprays into their mouth, uh, and they can taste it and swirl it, and then they spit it out so that they don't get too much caffeine in one day because they do this all day long. I interviewed a woman named Erna Knudsen who was one of the first women to break into the uh, world of uh, coffee cuppers who is still alive and she told me some very funny stories about what she went through uh, in order to do that. Coffee has always been maligned uh, for its supposedly bad health effects. Uh, starting from the very beginning, in 1511, the mayor of Mecca, the governor of Mecca, closed down all the coffee houses because supposedly uh, coffee was bad for you. In fact, because people were uh, writing satirical verses about him. Coffee also tends to make people kind of thoughtful and rebellious. Um, the French Revolution, the American Revolution were, were uh, planned in, in coffee houses. Um, Anyway, in the, in the late uh, 19th century, C.W. Post, who had had a sort of nervous collapse, but who was a very good businessman, was at the uh, uh, Kellogg Sanatorium in Battle Creek, Michigan, where he had their fake coffee made out of barley and other grains, and, uh, because they thought coffee was bad for you. So um, he invented Postum, and also grape nuts. But he made a fortune from doing this, and he was a very good advertiser, a very good negative advertiser. So he said absolutely horrible things about what coffee did to you. The coffee people hated him and made, made fun of him. So here, there's a picture over here of Melinda Kyle who uh, drank coffee, three cups of coffee every day uh, until, and was still 114 years old, but um, they used her in their ads. Uh, the coffee people, one of the, it's interesting to read these two books together, and very few people have, I found, read both the coffee, either they love the coffee history or they love the Coca-Cola history, uh, but they rarely read them together, and they really are sort of sibling publications, not just because they both have caffeine in them, but because the coffee people really were terrible advertisers, and Coca-Cola is a wonderful advertiser, and the coffee people never quite learned from them. Um, so here's one from 1934 showing that if you don't use the right coffee that your husband will scald you um, with the coffee. Uh, not exactly a, an appealing ad to many people. During World War II, I have a chapter on World War II in both of these books, which I, some of my favorites. Um, GIs uh, were very uh, grateful for getting any hot coffee they could get. Uh, it was the beginning of instant coffee, un unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, and there's a funny little cartoon there. Um, Instant coffee became very big after World War II when we were looking for instant everything. It was the age of Cremora and TV dinners and convenience trumping any kind of quality, as I think many of you in this room know. So because of that, they began, it didn't matter what kind of beans you used because this was such a crappy product. Um, they began to use Robusta. Now the best coffee is Arabica beans uh, and that's what most of, of the coffee in the world is. But nowadays, oh, 25 or 30 percent of it is Robusta, which is, as the name implies, a more robust form of coffee. It will grow at lower altitudes. Good coffee grows between about 3,000 and 6,000 feet in altitude on volcanic mountainsides in the tropics. Uh, and Robusta also is resistant to, to diseases that affect uh, uh, Arabica. So they began to use it in instant, and then that f went over into using it in canned coffee, like uh, Folgers in Maxwell House. So our coffee in the United States became basically 
diluted swill by the early 1960s. It was terrible stuff. I grew up thinking coffee was awful. I didn't drink it. Uh, and it was also an old-fashioned drink. Uh, one of the things that Coke and Pepsi did was to, you know, Pepsi named my generation, the baby boomers, the Pepsi generation. Uh, whereas uh, coffee was an old-fashioned thing for housewives or your, your boring fathers to sip at work. Um, so they made a lame effort to, to uh, try to capture the hippies with this top ad. The bottom one shows the people who originated Starbucks. This was in the early years of Starbucks when they didn't serve drinks, they only served fine beans. There were a whole bunch of these sort of grassroots hippie coffee roasters around the country. Starbucks was just one of them. Uh, and it only became a huge deal uh, after Howard Schultz bought the company in 1987 and began to make espresso-based drinks. But this was kind of, uh, it's, it's almost like microbreweries now. Uh, it was a rediscovery of the fact that coffee is really kind of like wine, that depending on where the beans are grown, how they're processed, et cetera, they're really quite distinctive and, and, and quite interesting. And I now write a column for the Wine Spectator about coffee for that reason, because it's the people who like fine wine also like fine coffee. By the way, I was not a big coffee drinker when I began writing the book, but I, I sort of became a, cof a coffee snob in the process of doing it as I kept getting all these really interesting things. Um, the, the idea of paying more for coffee uh, because all of the money was going to the roasters and not to the people who, who grew it began in the 70s. Every time the price for coffee went up, this really bothers me, in 1911, in 1950, in 1954, in 1977, it was usually because of a frost in Brazil or a drought or something like that. And there suddenly wasn't enough coffee, and the price would go up to where maybe there were livable wages for the people who grew it. And we would have congressional hearings complaining about this and saying how uh, it was a communist plot. Well, and there, are, there is price manipulation, and there are hedge funds involved and things like that. But by and large, uh, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for that argument. I think we should pay a lot more for coffee than we do as long as it would go back to the, uh, to the people who, who are doing all the work on it. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that. It, it, let's say I was a wonderful coffee grower in Guatemala who wanted to help the world and I wanted to pay minimum US minimum wage to my workers. I couldn't do that. I'd go out of business. Nobody would buy my beans. So there, it's not a matter of good guys and bad guys as much as, as you might think. Um, it's, it's a very complicated subject. It's interesting. Um, by 1981, there were a number of epidemiological studies that purported to show that coffee was bad for you in a number of really quite horrifying ways. It was supposed, it was connected with pancreatic cancer, uh, with breast lumps, with uh, birth defects. And as a consequence, the decaffeinated market surged. Uh, this is a 1980 cartoon from the far side uh, this rueful guy is sitting there having killed their guests. That settles it, Carl. From now on, you're getting only decaffeinated coffee. So it was quite topical at, at the time. Now, fortunately for us people who love coffee, it turns out that some much better epidemiological and quite convincing studies with large cohorts, and I wrote a book about epidemiology subsequently, by the way, called Inside the Outbreaks, and I'll have to give a plug for my various books in a second. Um, the coffee is getting a, a remarkably not only clean bill of health, it's good for you. Um, it prevents liver cancer. It, uh, people who drink more coffee don't commit suicide as often, um, and the list goes on. Now, I'm a little skeptical of all of these things um, because you can't do lab studies on people. You can only do it on rats. Um, but no, nonetheless, it's sort of a, a nice thought that caffeine isn't so terrible for you, and now coffee is my drug of choice. Um, the people who grow the coffee around the world are not slaves anymore in general, and they are very 
proud of their trees and proud of what they do, as is this farmer. And now I'm going to go to Coca-Cola. How did Coca-Cola become a symbol of the American way of life, and how is that changing now? Coca-Cola was invented in 1886 by an Atlanta pharmacist named John Pemberton, who was, it turns out, a morphine addict, um, but a, sort of a southern gentleman, a, a really nice uh, man. It's not that that was a, a terrible thing. Many people were morphine addicts. Uh, morphine was perfectly legal in those days. And many uh, Civil War veterans particularly, and many doctors and pharmacists particularly, were addicted, uh, um, and he was all of those things. Um, he was particularly interested, he, he invented a number of patent medicines. One of them was called extract of Stalingia, another one globe flower cough syrup. And um, he was intrigued by this drink called Vam Ariani. Vam Ariani was world famous in uh, the 1880s invented by Angelo Mariani uh, and made in Paris and in New York factories. Uh, it was endorsed by Emile Zola and Queen Victoria and uh, President McKinley and uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, Thomas Edison, a number of, of worthy, many, many uh, famous people, Sarah Bernhardt. And what it was was a Bordeaux wine with an infusion of coca leaf. So it had both uh, alcohol and cocaine in it. And at that time, everybody thought co that cocaine was a wonder drug. This is another one of those tropical pesticides that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, they thought that there was nothing the matter with it. Pemberton thought that it was a way to get off of morphine addiction or alcoholism. So, uh, and Sigmund Freud was taking it and thinking it was wonderful at the same time, wrote a whole book about how wonderful uh, the coca leaf was. And let me just say that, so, so Pemberton made a drink called um, French wine coca, and the recipe for it is over here on the left-hand side of the screen. <clears throat> and French wine coca was a Van Mariani ripoff, and there were many, many of them that were made in those days. Um, and Pemberton thought he made a superior uh, uh, product, and he probably did. But then in 1885, just a year after he had invented French wine coca, Atlanta voted to go dry as of July the 1st, 1886. <clears throat> Pemberton panicked because he thought that French wine coca was no longer going to be able to be sold. It turns out he was wrong. He was able to keep selling it as a, quote, medicinal beverage. <laughs> um, but he didn't know that. So he uh, took out the wine, and uh, but that was quite bitter. He added a lot of interesting things. Over here on the right-hand side, you see uh, this is the facsimile. This is in the new edition of my book that's gotten quite a bit of attention because uh, I just have it in there for the first time. This is in Frank Robinson's handwriting. Frank Robinson is the guy who named Coca-Cola and who wrote out this telltale script that's on the front of the book. So I think it's quite interesting. It's not quite the same as the one that I found in the company archives, but that doesn't surprise me because it sort of evolved. Uh, Pemberton died two years after inventing Coke. <clears throat> Frank Robinson then, who had been his partner, convinced Asa Candler, another Atlanta pharmacist, to take it over. And if he hadn't done that, it probably would have died like extract of Stalingia, um, but it didn't. So anyway, Coca-Cola evolved from French wine coca, but it was very bitter, so he added a whole lot of sugar. Uh, you'll see that this is for 36 gallons, and it's 216 pounds of sugar. And you'll see at the bottom of that first half, F.E. Coca, that's fluid extract of coca. So um, it had a very, very small amount of cocaine in it. Uh, it really wasn't enough to do a whole lot of anything to anybody. However, if you had five or six drinks of it, it also had twice as much caffeine as it has now. So you would be uh, pretty well wired. Uh, you, you'd get about a street hit of cocaine. Now, they took the cocaine out in 1903, so let me just make clear, it has not had any cocaine in it since 1903. They still do use 
the uh, coca leaf, which they import from Peru to Maywood, New Jersey, and they decocainize it under government supervision, and they use the fluid extract of decocainized coca leaf. This is the coca plant, and it's it looks kind of like uh, coffee, doesn't it? But the uh, leaves are not as glossy, um, and it's the leaves that you chew, not the berries, along with some lime. And uh, I've done this, and it's, uh, I, I, you know, as long as you don't make it into this white powder, this evil white powder, I, I personally don't think it's so terrible. Um, I've also had cola nuts. This is a picture, this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. This is a little girl in Niger, which is where I was doing research for my uh, Inside the Outbreaks book. And she was selling cola nuts, so I bought some. And what they do is they just chew them um, the same way that, that you would with a coca leaf. So I tried chewing one. It is so awful. I don't see how anybody does it. I had, I had to spit it out. But that's where the caffeine came from. Um, uh, at least originally, but th they quickly just went and used the caffeine from spent uh, tea leaves. It was a lot cheaper. Here are some ads. Um, Coca-Cola was pretty controversial from the very beginning because uh, of the cocaine content, but also because of the caffeine content and because they were advertising it to little children, as you see here. Um, even the early ads, they were, they were trying to make it uh, sort of a patriotic drink. So you see Uncle Sam pulling uh, Coca-Cola out of the White House there in the, that ad to the right. Oops, something happened. Oh well. Um, it was advertised as a medicine at first, as well as a delicious and refreshing soft drink. So it was both. Um, it was supposed to cure uh, headaches and hangovers, uh, and I think it probably did. Um, but it was also supposed to cure a mythical disease called neurasthenia, uh, which was sort of a status du jour kind of disease. If you, had, if you were a high power businessman who was really harried, or if you were a refined, sensitive woman, you could have neurasthenia and you needed a nerve tonic to buck you up, and that's Coca-Cola was one of many nerve tonics. And it was advertised here as a prescription uh, for a student, RX for students and all brain workers. Take one glass Coca-Cola at eight to keep the brain clear and mind active until 11. Um, one guy who absolutely hated Coca-Cola was named Harvey Wiley. He was the father of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. You can thank him for cleaning up our food He's a great man, I think. But he hated Coca-Cola, and it wasn't really very logical because he liked coffee just fine. But he thought that, uh, and by, that, by this time, there was no cocaine in it. So his objection was that, that caffeine was an added ingredient. It was artificially added. It was not a natural part of the drink. Coca-Cola said, yes, it is. It's part of the formula from the very beginning. It's not a, quote, added ingredient. So there was this big lawsuit because Wiley got the U.S. government to sue Coca-Cola in 1911. It was banned on army bases. Um, there was a big con Here he is warning. This is the shape of the Coca-Cola glass in 1911. This was in good housekeeping. And he's showing nervousness, habit, and indigestion being gremlins in, in the glass uh, so uh, uh, Coca-Cola reacted by uh, trying to make their drink as wholesome as possible. Under Robert Woodruff, who took over the company in 1923, he said, stop doing defensive advertising the way the coffee guys were doing. It's stupid. Just rise above it. Just only show positive things, be wholesome, show beautiful young women, not overtly sexy, but kind of, you know, attractive. Um, Use celebrities. And they invented this wonderful phrase, the pause that refreshes during the Depression when Coca-Cola became an affordable luxury, just a little something you could do for yourself for only a nickel and uh, just pause and have this refreshment and then go on with your uh, life. Um, now, as a result of this lawsuit that I mentioned, Coca-Cola decided not to ever show any children under the age of 12 
drinking Coca-Cola in any of their ads, and they've stuck to that. They haven't shown a child drinking Coca-Cola under the age of 12 in any of their ads since 1911, as far as I know. But it's not like they didn't want to attract children. <laughs> so they sort of uh, invented this modern image of Santa Claus starting in 1931 with these beautiful ads by uh, an artist named Haddon Sunblom, which I'm very fond of. But uh, until then, Santa was sometimes uh, dressed in red or green or yellow. Um, and he was often gaunt and t tall, not a fat, jolly guy. So uh, Coca-Cola had a lot to do with, with uh, the way that we think of Santa. During World War II, uh, coffee was important to the soldiers, but getting a drink of Coca-Cola was like a miracle. It was like this reminder of home and everything. That, so it's ironic that here it was, it had been banned on army bases 30 years before. Now it became a symbol of what we were fighting for. Coca-Cola was exempted from sugar rationing, not Pepsi, just Coke, was exempted from sugar rationing for use by the military. Coca-Cola men were put in army uniforms called technical observers, a designation for people who were vital to the war effort, like people, civilians who fixed airplanes. They were sent overseas and they started 64 bottling plants behind the lines. That's my favorite chapter in the book. I'm so fond of that. And I've got all these letters that the company let me ha uh, look at from their archives of, of soldiers writing back. And it really was a huge morale booster for, for, the, for them to get a Coke. Um, at the same time, however, Coca-Cola was doing quite well inside Nazi Germany. This is Coca-Cola in Ockrichten, um, and I found before World War II broke out, uh, the guy who led Coca-Cola was named Max Kite, and he led, you know, chance of Sieg Heil to Hitler, and there were big swastikas right next to the Coca-Cola logo. It's really quite shocking. Um, he kept the company going during World War II. He couldn't get... Um, any more syrup after Pearl Harbor. So he made up a new drink called Fanta uh, uh, inside Nazi Germany. And after the war, he took the company over again and was basically sort of a hero. If any of you know, I want to make a movie of the World War II era. Uh, uh, it would make a, abs I, I wrote a letter to George Clooney's agent because I thought George Clooney would be a perfect uh, Coca-Cola man starting up these things, but they returned my letter unopened, you know, and said, we don't take suggestions from people, blah, blah, blah. So after World War II, um, Coca-Cola was set up for international expansion in a big way. They'd already done it in a little way. This is from 1950. It's a cover of Time Magazine, as you can tell, and it says, world and friend, love that piaster, that lira, that ticky, and that American way of life. And so, uh, it had become a symbol of that American way of life, not only for us, in a good way, but for the communists, who spread rumors that Coca-Cola turned your hair white overnight, that it made you impotent, um, and they tried to get it banned from France and almost succeeded. So there's a whole chapter in the book called Coca Colonization and the Communists, which I'm very fond of. Um, Coca-Cola managed to succeed I seem to have a lot left out here. This is odd. Oh, well, that's okay. We, I'm running late anyway. Coca-Cola has been accused of a number of things, uh, such as uh, supporting paramilis paramilitary death squads who've murdered union employees in Colombia. Now, there's no question that union employees were murdered uh, by paramilitaries. The question is whether the Coke bottler had anything to do with it because many uh, uh, union employees from many different industries were murdered during the 1990s in Colombia. Uh, there is some pretty good evidence to my mind, although I can't say for sure, that the bottler was in collusion with them. There is no evidence that the main company in Atlanta was, but their attitude for, was, well, that's our bottler. We don't have anything to do with it. Well, without the Coke syrup, the bottler couldn't exist. So I raise a number of, of ethical issues there. They've also been um, criticized for depleting the water table in India, and here I'm less sympathetic with the critics. 
because the water table in India is being depleted primarily by really bad agricultural practices, and they use pesticide like it's going out of style. So um, basically, yes, they have contributed to some problems there. Now they're trying to do rainwater harvesting to replenish the water table for what they took out, which is fine as long as there's rain, but there often isn't. And some of their plants have been put in places where they shouldn't have been, where it's already a drought-stricken area. Oops. So the company has been criticized massively in the last 10 years for uh, helping to cause the obesity epidemic. Let me just add to my obesity for a second here. <laughs> to me, drinking Diet Coke or Coke Zero is like drinking decaffeinated coffee. I don't see what the point is. Um, so I drink regular Coke. But I don't drink a whole lot of it. And some people do. Um, and it does contribute, you know, a 12 ounce can of Coke that I'm drinking now has the equivalent of nine teaspoons of sugar in it, um, high fructose corn syrup. So the company, to its credit, is helping to sponsor exercise programs in almost every country around the world. Coca-Cola is the most widely distributed single product in the world. It's in every country legally except North Korea and Cuba. It's really amazing. And they're <clears throat> planning to do exercise programs in all of those countries. They're also offering about a quarter of their now 3,500 drinks around the world are low-calorie or no-calorie drinks. So all that I applaud them for. <clears throat> but they're also fighting tooth and nail against Mayor Bloomberg's idea of limiting the, the size of a drink. Um, and against any kind of special tax on sugary beverages, I think they're making a mistake. Um, they, it would, I think it would be brilliant if Coca-Cola would surprise Pepsi by supporting the idea of taxes on sugary soft drinks. I think it's inevitable. Sugary soft drinks are going down in, in per capita consumption. At some point, Coke Zero and Diet Coke combined are going to surpass, this is my prediction, the uh, regular Coca-Cola, as much as I don't like it. Um, so I think that they should not fight against these taxes, just my opinion. So basically, it's a fascinating, both of the histories are fascinating. Both of them have a lot of issues. I concluded basically that what we we are what we eat, and we are very interested in what we eat. And Andy and many others here in the room have written wonderful books about different food substances. But what we drink, something is there's something magical. It's like communion wine, especially a drink that has some kind of uh, drug in it, uh, is very meaningful to us. And I'm telling you, both coffee and Coca-Cola mean so much more to people than just simply a beverage. They have become iconic. They're, you know, I named the book, some, you know, somewhat ironically for God, Country, and Coca-Cola, but it's not really ironic to a lot of people who either work for the company. Uh, you know, uh, Asa Candler used to lead uh, the singing of Onward Christian Soldiers uh, at his sales meetings. They were missionaries. They were convinced that Coca-Cola was a boon to mankind. And many, many people, when they, there's a whole chapter in the book on New Coke from 1985, when they changed the flavor, people went berserk. They acted as if you had killed God. They really did. And then when they brought it back three months later, these letters, I've got the letters that people wrote to the company, it was like the second coming of Christ. It, it, it's just purely remarkable. And the same thing is true with coffee. I mean, people, if you deprive people of coffee tomorrow morning, nobody would die, but you would have an insurrection. Uh, King Charles II tried to ban coffee houses in 1675, and he took it back. He didn't go through with it because, like his uh, uh, father, he probably would have been beheaded. So with that, I think I will stop, and uh, hopefully we have some time for questions. Thank you very much.
Oh, oh, and I want to mention my other books. There, there's there's a, a book called Mirror, Mirror, which is uh, the New York Times said if you give your child this book, they don't need to go to college because it's a complete, like a complete education. <laughs> That's right. Um, there's uh, Japan's Tipping Point, which is uh, a slim book about my adventures in Japan just after the Fukushima meltdown. There's Victims of Memory, which is my most important book, which helped to put a stop to the repressed memory therapy epidemic of the late 80s and early 90s. And there's a couple of children's books called Jack and the Bean Soup and Silly Sadie, Hot Off the Press, all of which I wrote to get back at my wife in one way or another. But you can read the back cover or read the books very quickly. Okay, now. Come on, sit up. Okay. Questions? Uh, question. Can you okay? Can you stand up and oh, sure. yeah? Thank you, um, Malcolm Arnold. Um, you, there's a publication uh, a couple weeks ago that talked about um, just released a journal paper um, that caffeine is in uh, like tropical flowers, very low dosages, and it's used as a way of getting the uh, insects to pollinate so that they go back to that uh, mm -hmm. that uh, plant over and over again. Oh, so not only is it a, a pesticide in some cases, but it's something pleasant that they want to get. Right. They, they get the, the insects addicted to it so that they, they go back. Um, good for product, uh, I guess, for uh, renewable, uh, you know, buying their product again and again, uh, the flowers. Um, considering that you've done two books on uh, addictive substances or as some would say is addictive or, you know, uh, stimulants, have you, are you looking in the future as maybe like covering opium or cocaine or anything of that nature? Funny you should mention that. I, in my backpack, I have a history of opium uh, that I'm reading right now for a, a new book. I'm writing a book uh, about a tribe in the Golden Triangle area of Thailand where they used to grow poppies for opium. They weren't paid very much. It's a hill tribe called the Akha. Now they're growing coffee, very, very good coffee, and making a lot of money from it. And so uh, that book will have a chapter on uh, opium in it. But the, the, the history has been written. There's also a great book about uh, uh, the U.S. involvement, the CIA involvement in the uh, opium trade during the Vietnam War. Uh, by a guy named Alfred McCoy. So I don't think I'll write only about opium. But thank you. We have another question over here. Right here. Hi, uh, my name's Greg. <clears throat> uh, in Mexico, I believe Coca-Cola has sugar, whereas in the United States, it's high fructose corn syrup. It used to have sugar here in the United States. Could you comment on why the switch? Uh, some people I know prefer one versus the other, et cetera. Give us some insight. Okay. Uh, I personally prefer sh uh, cane sugar to high fructose corn syrup. I think it tastes better. And you can get that imported from Mexico in some stores, I'm quite sure, here in New York City. They must have a gourmet Coca-Cola from Mexico. They switched it in the middle of the 1980s uh, to high fructose corn syrup, I believe, because it became cheaper. Uh, and that's only because of a protective tariff uh, that we put on uh, imported sugar. So, and I think it would be very difficult to undo that, not because of our sugar industry, which isn't that potent, but because the corn industry would fight tooth and nail against that. They want that uh, market. So that's, that's what happened. Hi, um, Irina Cruz. You mentioned uh, coffee is the poster child for free trade. And you started to for speak fair about trade, yes. for fair trade, and you started to uh, elaborate on some pros and cons. Would you mind elaborating a little bit more on the cons? Sure. Um, fair trade, as it's defined by the uh, by FLO, the Fair Trade Labor Organization, which is based in Germany, uh, it has to be smallholders, people who don't have very large land, who have formed a democratically run cooperative and who jump through all the hoops and who pay for the privilege of uh, being called fair trade. And it's a transparent system, which is good. Somebody goes there and makes sure they're doing all the things they're supposed to be doing. The result of that 
is that people tend to think that if it's not fair trade, it means that the people who grew the coffee are mistreating their workers. But the people on larger plantations have not been able, by definition, to be fair trade, no matter how well they treat their workers. So Paul Rice, who is the head of the fair trade organization based in Oakland, California in the United States, for years tried to argue them into expanding the definition so that it could cover larger farms that were that passed decent criteria. And finally he gave up and he just switched on his own, I think last year, two years ago. And he hasn't made it a big thing, but it has caused a huge amount of controversy and furor that he's giving in to major corporations. There are people who don't want fair trade companies to be supported unless they're only doing 100% fair trade, et cetera. It's a complicated mess. There are all kinds of, there's Rainforest Alliance, there's Utz Cafe, there is, uh, Starbucks has its own cafe practices certification. All of them ha are pretty good, I think. I don't have anything against them. When the price goes up, uh, it becomes less meaningful to people. Uh, there are many people who feel in the coffee industry that it's not sustainable, that people will buy fair trade once or twice just to be nice, but unless it's a really good product, it's not going to keep doing it. And if you make a really good product, then you can command a premium price anyway. So they say the best way to go is with a high price. I'm not sure that, that's, that people are capable of always doing that. So uh, I think fair trade is a good thing, um, and I'm a supporter of it, but it's not a black and white issue as almost nothing in, in coffee is. Another question right here. Uh, one of my problems in learning about nutrition is that I think the mass media does a very poor job of conveying scientific results to the public mm -hmm. in, in the sense that uh, they tend to uh, want to sell eyeballs to advertisers and in that cause uh, exaggerate the results. And Can you put the microphone closer? To sure, you? sure. Um, for, for instance, uh, a lot of times we've heard that uh, coffee, uh, if you have a, a, a existing heart conditions, you drink a cup of coffee and you'll fall over dead. Uh, ten years ago, a cardiologist told me that, no, you can drink ten cups of coffee and it won't do you any harm. So my question is, a lot of study has been done. Now, what is the risk of uh, heart problems uh, when you consume coffee? Well, the good news is that I think that they're concluding that uh, I, I wouldn't suggest 10 cups a day, um, but that, you know, maybe three cups a day is, is not bad for your heart. Um, it, it seems to make sense. You know, if you have coffee and you're not used to it, it does raise your heart rate. But once you are used to it, I don't think that it does. So I'm not a great expert on this, but I'm pretty sure that the conclusion now is that there, the epidemiology shows that coffee drinking is not associated with heart disease. Another question. Um, Red Berry, uh, would you put uh, chocolate in the same uh, category with uh, coffee as another bean-based substance with uh, the stimulant theobromin, which might... Uh, be emitted as an insect repellent. <laughs> and it yeah. seems to have a, lot, a common history. Yeah, yeah. Chocolate uh, is another tropical uh, plant that has theobromine, which is very closely related to caffeine. And uh, it also involves a lot of interesting issues. My editor at the Wine Spectator, who I was hoping might be here tonight, but he has a family obligation, he writes uh, about chocolate for the Wine Spectator. And we were just, I went and saw him this afternoon, and we were discussing this very matter uh, of the kind of similar issues that are involved and uh, quite fascinating. But unfortunately, there have been several histories of chocolate written. I, d I have a big file <laughs> if anybody wants me to write about it, but I, I, I think there have been some pretty good books out there. Okay. Other questions? Hi, uh, what does Coca-Cola think of you? Like you or hate you or somewhere in between? Well, you know, when the, when the book first came out in 1993, 
I think the company felt blindsided. They had been very, very nice to me. I grew up in Atlanta. I have a lot of connections to Coca-Cola. My grandfather, it turns out, testified in a very important Coca-Cola trial in 1914, which is a funny story also. He, he, was, he was a pharmacist in Atlanta, and they asked him what people, they were trying to sue a company called Coke, K-O-K-E, put them out of business and saying when people come to your drugstore Mr. Pendergrast uh, what are they what are the nicknames they ask for for Coca-Cola and he said well Coke or a shot in the arm or dope or <laughs> another brick in the Candler building <laughs> so that was funny uh, my grandmother almost married Robert Woodruff um, so I would have been either rich or not here because they didn't have any children um, but anyway uh, they felt uh, blindsided because I had found this formula for Coca-Cola in the company archives, it, and it didn't say Coca-Cola; it just had a big X on it. And I put it in the book, and I th and and there were, you know, I had the whole chapter on the the Nazi uh, era, um, and uh, there were some allegations of, of evil doing in. Um, Guatemala in the late 1970s, similar to the ones you saw about Colombia now. So um, they weren't very happy with me, to be honest with you. But this, this is 20 years on, and the spokesman that I dealt with primarily, they still, they wouldn't let me interview their executives this time around, which is too bad. Um, but I did talk to uh, their spokespeople, and I talked to other people sort of off the record. And I sent a copy of the book to them, and I asked him, did you read it? What did you think? You know, And is there something wrong? Because I would need to fix it. And he said, well, I'm sure there are things wrong, but he wasn't very specific. But he said, basically, you know, Without, you know, total access to everybody for this edition, it looks like you've done a pretty good job. So I felt good about that. But I don't think they're going to be selling it in the uh, world of Coca-Cola Museum, uh, which I wish they would because it should be there. And uh, a million people a year go through there. So, uh, When was decaf invented and was it Sanka? Um, decaffeinated coffee was invented in the early 20th century, and I think, I'm trying to remember, I think Sanka was the first one, but it was also called Decafa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you'd know that. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it was invented by, what's his name? It's Nescafe, wasn't it? it? That was the decaf Nescafe? Was no, no, no. Nescafe was uh, was uh, invented in like 1938. Uh, or before that. I no, the, it's confusing. The the first instant was also at the beginning of the 20th century, right. um, and I'd have to go back and look in my own book to make sure. But the, it was a German guy. Ah, his name was Ludwig Roselius, and he thought that caffeine had killed his father, and so he invented. He figured out how to decaffeinate it and look up Roselius or decaffeinated in the back of my book, which I don't have right now, or, or you could hand it over. <laughs> Another question? Over, we have a question up here. Can we get a mic? Oh, I'm sorry. It's that one. Do you have a favorite uh, country's coffee that you drink? <laughs> well, it's like asking a wine uh, person what's their favorite wine. It always irritates everybody, you know. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll tell you some of my favorite countries. Uh, I love uh, Ethio Ethiopian Yurgachev, Guatemalan Antigua, uh, Costa Rican Tarazu, uh, Rwandan coffee is wonderful, Papua New Guinea coffee is wonderful, Sumatra and Sulawesi uh, is different because of the weird way that they process it, but very earthy, sort of good after dinner with chocolates. Um, a lot, a lot of wonderful coffee. Of course, Kona is a very well-rounded, wonderful coffee. Uh, Jamaica Blue Mountain is good stuff. Uh, this Thai coffee that I'm writing about is, is quite remarkable also. It's right up there with all the rest of them. So, you know, they talk about terroir in, in wine, and it's the same thing with coffee, and I'm sure it's the same thing with most 
products. But it depends on the type of tree, the kind of climate and wind and soil, the way that it's processed, and then the way it's brewed. So there's so many ways along the line to, to affect a cup of coffee. I want to, uh, you have a question, final question. Yeah, I've, I've heard of people um, buying um, raw coffee beans and roasting them themselves in popcorn poppers. Is it, does, <laughs> does this actually produce good coffee? Yeah. Yeah, it's called fluid bed roasting uh, in a popcorn popper or something that w where you have hot air blowing the beans around. It does work. I wouldn't recommend using it for popcorn. Uh, you should get a, a popcorn popper that's dedicated to, to the coffee. I actually roast my own beans sometimes, and I do it in, in my oven. Uh, I have a little pie uh, plate made out of aluminum with regular holes all in the bottom of it so that the air can go through it. And I, t I talk about this in the uh, appendix. I explain how to do that. And it's really, it's magical. Everybody should do this. Everybody used to do this back in the uh, middle of the 1800s. You'd just go buy green beans. And they, they would often, you know, just make them in their frying pan and stir them. And they would get over-roasted or unevenly roasted. But uh, freshly roasted coffee, there's nothing like it. It's just magic. And it's kind of like drinking Coca-Cola because it, it, uh, it produces carbon dioxide. That's the reason why you have to pre-stale coffee before you put it in a, a package unless you have a one-way valve bag that they've invented now. All the good coffee, you see that. But when you grind it right away after you've roasted it, it fizzes. You, you know, when you brew it. <laughs> and, it, and it really makes a difference. You should try it. I want to thank Mark for coming all the way from Vermont to join us today. I do want to point out that we have his books over there for sale. He has consented to autograph them. You can be his best friend. Uh, all you need to do is purchase one. He also brought a whole suitcase of his other books down here. Which I and, don't want to bring home with me. And he really doesn't want to take it home. So um, anybody interested uh, can see Mark up here or buy the book over there. We still have our coffee over here, and we still have Coca-Cola over here, and we hope the conversation can Do we continue. know what kind of coffee we have over there? What We have uh, Oak Cafe coffee. Do we know? Does anybody? What? No, it's Oh, Cafe. Oh, it's maybe. No, I think it's Oh Cafe. We bought it. We, we it's from it. a great coffee house, but we don't know where the beans came from. Oh, well. They, they, they came from the grocery stores. <laughs> oh, that's not true. Thank you very much for coming.